we read from Matthew chapter 2, beginning from verse 1 all the way to verse 12. The visit of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. When Herod called the Magi secretly, and then he found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Wise men still seek him. Amazing this uh, the story we we normally talk at uh, at Christmas time around it and we take the time four weeks before Christmas to talk about it and it's not until you do some expositional teaching on the text that you actually slow down and uh, discover some things so I trust that tonight we can take a, a few minutes and, and ask ourselves the question put ourselves in that position back then uh, as either someone being on the site or an observer on the side being one of the characters and just hear from what happened at that time and try to get the picture of that. Uh, the, a traditional view like that, and, and we have that actually at uh, Christmas time here, we have nativity scene and we've got, this is a more elaborate one. I think probably the only thing they're missing on this one is probably the angels up there. And um, I did find a different one with angels on it, but it's missing some of the others. So this is basically a commercialized view. Why do I say that? Is because you've got everything at once. And uh, the, but when you follow through text by text, uh, verse by verse, the, uh, the angels were not there at the, at the um, um, in the manger. They were there with the shepherds and told them, go ahead, go to, to, to Jerusalem. So this picture uh, correctly presents it, but what it does have, it's got the wise men there uh, together with the shepherds, which is not the case and we'll, we'll see that. So why do we do it this way? Well, it's a nice convenient way to make sure at one scene, whether it's up here or as we have it in the lighthouse, so that we get a picture of all the characters in, in there. Okay, and uh, in, including the angels and everything that happens. And also when we're sending Christmas cards, it's nice to have, I, I, like, Christ, I like sending Christmas cards that are fully loaded. They've got all the, all the characters of the, of the Christmas and surrounding stories in it. Uh, so um, anyways, that, if you take a look at verse 1, this will help us clarify as to what we mean by the mad guy not being there. Uh, in chapter 2 and verse 1, as Pat read, it says, Now after, the word after here is operative, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod, King, Be uh, uh, King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And so uh, when Jesus was born, the wise men were nowhere inside. They were probably still somewhere 
Um, some commentators may say they were still somewhere near Kuwait, <laughs> looking at the stars, trying to figure out where this is and um, what, what's going on here. And so anyways, when they come, they come first to uh, Jerusalem, and uh, there's, a, there's a reason for that. And, and we'll get to that in a minute. So they, they, uh, they arrive there. In the verse here it says, um, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And what, the, 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 the point of the Greek, when you read it through here, in these couple of verses, it, it was highlighted to me, because it doesn't, in English it doesn't come up, but they came in talking. They, they entered the city talking. In other words, they just didn't ask. It looks like they just didn't ask King Herod. They were asking a number of people uh, along the way, uh, which will be explained later why it says that all Jerusalem was concerned, not just King Herod, but all, uh, all of Jerusalem. So anyways, after Jesus was born, these uh, Magi arrived. Now, depending on the translations you have, you may have a different uh, uh, term with them, may, maybe calls them wise men. It says here also in verse 11 that they went to a house. Okay, and so this is some time later. Uh, Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph didn't stay in the barn. <laughs> they only stayed there for the census. And the census, every place hung out the sign, no vacancy. Uh, there's probably a couple of reasons why they would have hung out no vacancy. And I, I remember discussing that in another time here at uh, Christmas. And it had to do with the fact that... Um, the, uh, dealing with her uh, pregnancy and um, that some people may not have wanted to take them uh, and it's not quite clear yet uh, about their marriage when it happened but people already knew at least back in their hometown that uh, this girl was pregnant before they got married and so even as, as here in Kuwait uh, they say in some hotels as well, you need a certificate of marriage if a, a man and a lady come in. And so a tradition that is current here would have been there, may have been there 2,000 years ago as well. And the innkeepers say, I'm sorry, there's no room in here, but you can go out there somewhere. So, uh, but they wouldn't have stayed there, right? So the Magi come not to a stable, but they come to a house. So it helps us reset that so don't take offense if we here at TLC show the wise men and the stable at the same time okay we, we do know our history we just again for commercial purposes we try to shove everything in at once um, we, we don't wait a couple of years after Christmas because Christmas comes every year to show the wise men which is probably how long they might have waited uh, at least a year by the time they got there let's look at, at the Magi very briefly the wise men uh, popularized as the wise men. Uh, these are actually, um, the word magos means to be a magician uh, in, in the Orient. It also doubles up as, as an astrologer, uh, someone who's gazing into the sky, soothsayer, etc. There's a, a number of terms that can be used. Now, um, this word doesn't come up. It only comes up in this context here. And again, once in Acts, uh, talking about a magician, okay, um, but where we get it from, where the history comes back into Daniel chapter 2. And you remember the, the time when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and then he calls in his magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans. Okay, that's these guys, the Magi, that's them. He calls them in and says, guys, interpret for me the dream. And they say, no problem. Tell us the dream. <laughs> and he says, no, if you guys are genuine, you tell me the dream and the interpretation. And they're like, forget it. It ain't happening. We don't know. Uh, Daniel does. He, he does know it. And uh, as a direct result, you can see it also in chapter 4. And then in chapter 511, if you have your Bibles there in Daniel uh, chapter 511, it actually lists out uh, a, a good uh, list of of these names or the, the uh, titles and the description to which uh, it was given. Uh, the point here, this is now the story in Daniel 5 of the handwriting on the wall. And this is King Belshazzar, who was actually not even an actual descendant of him, but in, gene, in, in 
in writings, they would often say the uh, Belshazzar would identify uh, his father as Nebuchadnezzar, even though he wasn't his biological father, uh, probably not even related, but because to keep the lineage of the king and etc. etc. Anyways, uh, what happens in chapter 5, verse 11, uh, they, they need to interpret this thing and uh, nobody can do it. Daniel now is an old man and uh, retired, uh, enjoying his retirement. And what they say here is uh, they can't figure out who's going to interpret this thing. And so they say, well, bring in, um, bring in Daniel, verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, predecessor would be the better term, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, note this now, magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because of an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve problems, were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let this Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation in which he does. And so anyways, this, this group, this is the Magi, and this is actually a, um, a group of people who were uh, quite elite. Now they, were, they themselves were not kings. So uh, they, again, uh, I, I love, just ask, ask Vinod, I love hymns, I love hymns. But on occasion, hymns do have a problem <laughs> and do set us off on the wrong uh, tangent. For example, the hymn, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Uh, they were not kings. Okay. Um, no, they, they were the magi. Okay. They were these astrologers. But in relationship to king, and, and, and probably the songwriter, when he's writing this, We Three Kings, are, what, what is important is that these, these kings, his, these magi, actually were king makers or king installers. They would appoint or rationalize or validate or uh, install, ordain, appoint, whatever you call it, the kings. And uh, they had a very high position. They could also, they could also remove kings, okay? Uh, they could do that. They had, they had that kind of authority uh, here in the, um, in, the, um, in the East. And so they were, they were very, uh, they were the elite in society. They were very powerful and uh, they were very wealthy uh, men, and, and it is, which is, of course, reflected in the gifts they bring. They didn't bring cheap gifts. They brought pretty expensive and elaborate uh, uh, gifts. Um, also, the, the other myth that uh, comes in, uh, again, perpetuated by um, um, tradition and uh, even songs, um, we three kings of Orient. Now, there may have been three, but the chances of it having been only three are pretty small. Uh, there would have been a delegation of them. And for sure, even if there were only three of them that came, uh, and, and how do we get three? Well, it's because there's three gifts. And so naturally tradition just assumed three. And, and, um, and they came from different places. Uh, in fact, yesterday we were talking to a, a brother from uh, Ethiopia, and he reminded us about uh, how legend, history, actually has one of them coming from Ethiopia. And they actually have that. This was believed for hundreds of years, and they still believe it in, in Ethiopia that uh, one, of, uh, one of them was uh, from there. And so they had a lot of the countries, and especially in the, in the Orient and uh, in Africa, they had people wise, these astrologers, who uh, enchanters, magicians, and uh, they would pick things out. They could see something of, this, of, the, um, of the other world that was there. But more than likely, there was a whole entourage of them that came. Uh, you, don't go, <laughs> you don't go traveling across the desert um, as three wealthy people with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then travel alone. Like, that's not very smart. Um, and, and chances of them having done that are almost next to nothing, at least from the history of about the Magi. They would have traveled with bodyguards and, and an entourage of people and their cooks and their maids and servants and all of that stuff. And there would have been a good number of them. Uh, it's estimated from, uh, in, in fact, some traditions say there were 12 uh, uh, wise men or Magi. 
Um, and some traditions say there would have been up to maybe even a couple of thousand people in the entire entourage as they traveled. Well, we don't know, but the point is uh, that probably a whole lot more than three traveled. Uh, maybe only a few came to Jesus, but uh, anyways, there's that. Now, what's the significance of this manga in Matthew? found this very interesting of, of what's happening here. Well, first of all, uh, the, the question is, why only Matthew? Why, why did only Matthew talk about the three magi? I mean, you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they talk a lot about, uh, or at least Luke, sorry, uh, talks a lot about other stuff. And you think, well, at least he could have thrown in a few words about that. No one says anything about that. Well, just looking at to see who, who is writing to who. Um, Matthew, he is writing to uh, Jewish people. He, he's always writing to people uh, and he's telling them, and thus is fulfilled the Old Testament. So he's tying the Old Testament together with the New. And uh, he's also uh, pointing out that this is the fulfillment and so forth. And so his audience would have been people who were very familiar with the Old Testament. Uh, uh, Mark, Luke, and John, not so much so. And uh, the, the mag, uh, Magi were men of the Orient from the, uh, from the East side. And when uh, Luke, uh, Mark, and John were writing, they were writing more already to a Greek and to a Roman people, and that's more from the West. And there wasn't much overlap between the uh, uh, Magi from the East to, to the West. Although there is story, there's a story of the Magi one time coming to King or to uh, uh, to Nero Caesar in Rome. They actually sent a delegation of Magi went there, and he heard about these guys coming, and apparently he gave them the royal carpet treatment. I mean, he had enough uh, enemies he didn't want anymore, and uh, they were because they were very powerful people. He just lavishly treated them, and uh, probably out of fear because. Uh, of his, their, his relations with the territories out here of the people he had and uh, he needed all the friends that he could get and uh, they, he was actually afraid and knew their history that if he doesn't keep them happy uh, they're not going to make his life very good and so he treats them well uh, and when they leave they don't say anything negative and history records that he actually was like paraphrased wiping his brow and going Phew. Good. They didn't fire me or take some of my stuff away that was there. Not, not that he would have been concerned so much about Rome itself, but at least the territories out here. So that's, that's the type of significance that they had there, the influence. And so by Matthew writing this, uh, he's writing to them and he's tying together also because the people at that time, now we don't know that so much unless we read the, it, this in history books, but the um, Daniel, when he was promoted, as we read in chapter 5 and verse 11, uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar as the head of the Magi, please keep in mind that his tradition and his respect, as we've seen here, would have carried on down. And so for, for the next few hundred years, the Magi were expecting this world-dominant leader to come. He's going to come. He's coming. And in fact, if you read Daniel, because Daniel could read uh, he's reading the scrolls of Jeremiah and uh, figuring out, and he was the one who figured out, hey man, the 70 years are up. What's going on here? And so he's digging this through. And uh, now with his influence over the other man guy, they, he would have no doubt left them a tradition that there will be a ruler, a king, whose kingdom will never end. In fact, it was his interpretation of that dream that would be there at the base of that. This rock from the mountain which would smash all the other kingdoms and in itself would grow. And then you tie it together with uh, Micah, which is the very verse that's here because when King Herod uh, went uh, to figure this out, um, he, he had to turn to the scribes and, and, and uh, the theologians of his day and he asked them, where is the Messiah supposed to be be born? This we find in our text in Matthew chapter two and verse six and he quotes here, um, or Matthew does, he says, uh, in Bethlehem of Judea they responded, for it is written by the prophet. And now in verse 6 quotes Micah chapter 5 verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And this one here focuses just on Israel, but uh, the interpretation of the dream that Daniel gave uh, 
for which he was promoted the head of the Magi was that a world ruler is going to come and his kingdom shall have no end and his kingdom shall dominate the entire earth. Um, how's that for missions, huh? Um, and, and it's Matthew, Matthew, who makes, gives us the clearest of all of the great commissions. Mark has it as well, but Matthew makes it clear. In the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, go ye therefore into all the world and preach. And so here at the beginning, Matthew is tying this together with Daniel who prophesied this, who's head of the Magi, leaves it to the tradition. Those men for hundreds of years are waiting for this coming ruler of the entire world of whose kingdom shall never end, whose kingdom shall bring peace whose kingdom shall be one that will uh, fill and fulfill the hearts of people, no longer filled with trouble, toil, disease, or pestilence, or anything. And they're anticipating for this. And so they were diligently uh, looking uh, for him. Well, uh, another uh, significant part on this, right about Jesus, King of the Jews, they do identify that. And uh, the, 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 the purpose or the heading of this of the magi remember they are not three kings but three king makers and so matthew has the king makers come to this king of kings who the people of course didn't recognize because he's just a little baby in a crib but the magi recognized him and they honored him and they saluted him as the king who is coming and uh, so uh, M Matthew, along with the others, they do conclude the earthly life of Jesus, the, the carnal life of Jesus, with a sign, uh, king, uh, that he claims to be uh, a king on that. Okay. Um, so Matthew, uh, interestingly, also is the only one who uses the term kingdom of heaven. The others, Mark, Luke, and, and, and John, uh, Mark and Luke more so, uh, talk about the kingdom of God, but not the kingdom of, of heaven, which is another topic, and I don't want to rabbit trail down that one. But uh, what we've got here now is, please note that it's King Herod, and I underline the word King Herod, who is trying to murder Jesus. And we'll see that in a, uh, either next Sunday or in a couple of Sundays from now, about uh, in, in verse 16, when Herod is going to uh, kill him. Why is he so interested in killing him? Because, of course, uh, he sees uh, what, what's uh, coming up. So this is uh, the, the significance of why Matthew writes this particular section here because the people he was writing to and the first century Jewish people, for them this is a big deal, a really big deal because of the prophets that were there and they're prophesying and they're talking towards not just uh, like Mark, um, take, take for example John. Uh, John presents Jesus as the son of God, the well, son of God who, who takes away the sins of the world. The, and that's the, 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 the Roman world had their thinking of the gods are up there and uh, they, do have, they do have some of their own stories about the gods coming down and so forth, but they were in that mystical world of the gods out, out there. Um, but the Jews were very much rooted in the Old Testament prophets and uh, recognized uh, the word, the name Emmanuel, God with us. And so they were looking for this physical manifestation of the Messiah. I don't think they fully got the concept of king but Matthew over and over and over again repeats it, starting with John the Baptist. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom. There's a kingdom coming. And if there's a kingdom coming, it means the king is coming. Then Jesus comes and says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Again, implying there's a king coming. Uh, in Mark, uh, in Matthew, sorry, uh, chapter 13, all the parables that are in there about the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. Uh, the Beatitudes. Um, you can look at all the, all the Beatitudes. Blessed are them, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. So the, the term uh, and also the prayer of Jesus, uh, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is a very important theme, king and kingdom in Matthew and in the Gospels. And we, we need to understand that as well as, 
as subjects of the king and subjects within the kingdom, the implications of that. Let's take a look at Herod uh, for a few minutes. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In the days of uh, Herod the king, uh, Matthew made sure he writes Herod the king and not Herod the Great. Herod the Great was his self-acclaimed accolade that he put on himself. Um, anyone around him for sure didn't call him that. Uh, the guy was an absolute murder, murderous uh, authoritarian. The guy was a, a butcher to the nth degree. If you read, and I don't want to get much into that it's for another time, and it's also not, um, not a nice thing to hear all the stories about how this guy treated even his own family. It was just uh, atrocious. Uh, he, he just, uh, yeah, he, he was a mess. And, and that is displayed, in, as we read later, uh, when he realized the mad guy had, uh, did not report back to him, uh, rather than hunting out, like, just, just figure this out, right? You figure this out. You're the king, uh, and, and, and the mad guy come, and he knew. He knew exactly who the, and in fact, in fact, there is a story about the magi coming to Herod some 30 years earlier, okay? So, because now by the time Jesus was born, he's been in power for quite some time, a few decades, and they say that the magi actually came to him, him earlier, and there was some disturbance that happened at that time. So he's very familiar with the magi. Uh, anyway, so he, that's why he also treats them nice. You know, he just really uh, gives them the red carpet uh, treatment as well. But later, of course, when he realizes he's been duped by them, uh, he goes back into Jerusalem and just literally butchers up everyone, every boy, two years and under. And you think, like, why do you have to be so sadistic about it? I mean, you've, you've got your own agents. You just, as I mentioned, the, the Magi, they weren't, they weren't three guys on a camel who just came over by themselves. This would have been an entourage. This is a major event that happened. So now Bethlehem's a small little town, five miles south of Jerusalem. There's not much happening in the town of Bethlehem, okay? So even if it's a year or so later, which it probably was, uh, about a year later, if, if the Magi come into town, I mean, this is the big event. And the Bible clearly says, if you take a look in, back in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 2, verse um, 9, they go on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, they may have been the only ones who see it. I don't think so, but even if they were the only ones who seen it, um, for sure, talk would have gone around town that the Magi came to town. And who did they visit? It doesn't take too many private investigators to find out whose house they visited. This is how neurotic Herod was when he came in. He didn't chance it and he killed all the boys. And he could have just narrowed it down to who he visited and killed Jesus. Doesn't do it. Um, anyways, that tells us a little bit about uh, Herod. The guy was politically tuned up. Uh, very tuned up uh, with the Romans. In fact, that's how he, he got his uh, kingdom. He went over there and uh, they actually bought their way into it. His dad was a ruler and, and so palmed a lot of, uh, or greased a lot of palms and um, got himself made king over that uh, particular region. And uh, he knew how to play the political ropes. And uh, we see that even at the end at Jesus' death, uh, him and Pilate were not good friends. But uh, for whatever expedient reasons, they all suddenly became friends because they had a common enemy. And so he, could, he knew how to hop the fence and uh, play both sides when, when necessary. Um, I mentioned this earlier in, in chapter 2 and verse 3. It says there, um, when the Magi came in saying or talking, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose and we have come to worship him. And then Herod the king heard this. He was troubled. And look what it says. And all Jerusalem with him. Why? Why all Jerusalem? You would think that the average guy in Jerusalem would be happy. Because most people didn't like the guy. They'd be happy if Herod would uh, be exited out and another king comes in. Well, here's the problem. By now, Herod had such a horrible reputation of his... Uh, 
of his uh, murderous events. I mean, he, he would literally kill his own family members and wives and kids and everything um, if he didn't like them. Uh, so the reason everyone was upset is because their neck is on the line. <laughs> and they knew if King Herod is threatened for his kingdom, he's going to stop at no means any, to kill anybody to make sure that no king is a rival to him. And so uh, all uh, of Jerusalem, and, and it actually says that all of them were. Well, enough of that. Let's uh, look at the text and the title of the text and the purpose of the text and what is it that we're here for tonight and what is it that we extract uh, from this. Um, a few things I want to pull out for us tonight here as uh, takeaways is, uh, number one, let's lift up our eyes. We have to lift up, lift up our eyes uh, from the wise men. The lessons from the wise men. So if we, if we were to just to observe the Magi and what they all did. Please turn with me to Psalm 121, please. Psalm 121. We're going to read this uh, short psalm. And it's a classic. It's one of the classic ones of uh, encouraging us uh, when, uh, when we need encouragement and we need to see the bigger picture of what is going on. It's a song of ascent. It says, with, starting at the beginning, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? Uh, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let me just stop there before we go on. Uh, the, Magi, the Magi had this uh, history for hundreds of years based on Daniel who based it on the prophets, Jeremiah, etc., that the king, a king, is coming who's going to dominate the world. And his kingdom, there shall be no end. And uh, so these wise men, let's learn from the wise men. In fact, I, I like the word wise men because in our everyday language, it, it makes more sense. They genuinely are wise, and here's why. Um, they didn't they, they weren't myopic. They didn't look at their own belly button. They, they, they looked beyond. They lifted up their eyes. They were looking. They were searching. That, that's why they were the magi. That's why they were powerful. That's why they were uh, elite. That's why they involved with all this. They, they, they looked beyond and they were involved. Now, now, we do recognize that there was a negative component uh, to that. Um, as we know, Pharaoh had as well. He had his own magicians and enchanters and so forth who could reproduce some of the... Uh, um, uh, the plagues that were there uh, based on demonic forces, but uh, people that are sensitive to the spirit of God, and we've seen this for years in Africa, in the years that we were there, uh, in a particular town, in, and um, although it's diminishing recently, but you know, a few decades ago, uh, evangelists would come into town and the people they would primarily target are who? The witch doctor, the local witch doctor. Why? Because the witch doctors in the town who basically wielded the power, even though they had a chief and even though they had all of that stuff in place, at the end of the day, even the chiefs would go to the witch doctors. Okay? And so if, if the witch doctor would be sensitive to the spirit world. And very much awake to the spirit world. The only problem was, of course, the wrong, uh, the dark side. And so, but when they got saved, when they got saved, they never had any issues about the spirit world. They understood the working of the Holy Spirit. They understood the, the voice of God, the speaking of God, because they were already attuned to the spirit world. Is this now, because they're born again, they learn to readjust the tuner to God's voice and not Satan's voice. And, uh, and, and that propelled them in, in the right way. And so what, what happened to these wise men, they were listening and they had their uh, antennas up and they were lifting up their eyes. And so I want to encourage us that we lift up our eyes. We, we read the text, we read the text, but let's not be ever content with only the text. Let us lift up our eyes and look to the author of this text and have a living, walking relationship. We are going through every service that we have at TLC. We're going through expositional preaching. What does that mean? We go through it verse by verse and we look at what, what does it say? What did it say back then and what is it saying now? And God's spirit, the same spirit that wrote this to begin with, is still speaking today. 
And so let's keep our eyes and ears open. Let's lift up our eyes. Back to Psalm 121. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He, will, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. And the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you. You're going in and you're, you're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Well, this we can realize when we start off by identifying with verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the hill. These wise men would have never seen the star if they wouldn't have had their eyes lifted up. Second thing is they had to leave their comfort zone. Many times people can see it, and, uh, but see the, uh, uh, see the blessings of God, hear, hear of it, hear of his moving, but uh, the, the immediate comfort zone is, no, I don't want to go there. These wise uh, men, as they would have traveled through the desert, they knew very well the dangers of traveling through the desert, through the bandits and so forth. Uh, they had them back then, and they had them right up until recent times. You can read the story of Lawrence of Arabia. Um, modern day, that happened back then. People who looted and robbed and killed uh, the caravans that were uh, coming through. Uh, and yes, there's dangers outside. Of course there are, but lift up your eyes. Who's protecting us? Okay. And you move, you move when God tells you to move. And so that's what these guys did. They left their comfort zone and they uh, went on. What did they do? They brought their gifts to Jesus. Okay. Um, a little bit about the gifts. A lot of pictures that we show again in the cards they show, you know, bringing in a small box. <laughs> they probably didn't have small boxes. I mean, they probably had lavish gifts. Uh, they, they would have installed many kings before, but this is the king of kings. And so I'm sure they brought all kinds of elaborate uh, gifts that came, uh, that they would have brought with them. Now, we don't know how much, that, that's beside the point, but what they did is they offered the best. And you read of Frankenson and, and myrrh and... and um, and gold. Um, a lot could be said on that, including even bringing in myrrh. Why myrrh? Um, when Jesus lived 33 years, that was a common mixture also for fragrance for um, burial. Um, you could explore this quite a bit. We'll leave it. But, but coming back to their gifts, they brought what they could. And so when it comes to us, what are we bringing? What we can and I, I like the story the best tonight when um, um, it was called for the offering time. It just went through my mind again because going through this, a couple of things. Number one, I, I remember the story of a little boy who, when the plate was passed, he didn't have any money, but he felt the, the heart of God speaking to him that he had to give, give himself. And so he, he puts the plate down and stands in the plate. He got it. He got it. He got it. Uh, Romans 12, 1 talks about that, isn't it? Um, therefore, uh, present. Um, therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That, and uh, these, these wise men, they, they came with their gifts and they brought it. And um, we, we, they, they, they went back. Um, and this was the provision that, of course, Mary and Joseph had then to take off and go be down in, in uh, Egypt for those years and then, and then come back. Um, what is it that we're bringing to God? God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need our gifts. He doesn't, he doesn't need our offering when we bring our offerings and we bring, return our tithes. It's not that he needs it. Um, but he knows we need to give it to him because we need to learn to release. If our hands are full with the stuff that we have, how can God bless us more? Because our hands are full. And we learn to release. And then he will, he will replenish uh, with this. Uh, what else did they do? In chapter 2, uh, in our, back in our text, he um, they says they came and brought their gifts. And they worshipped God. And uh, we write that on our offering envelope as well. Uh, bring our gifts with, with a cheerful heart. It's with joy that we bring it. 
And um, these men, they actually came and worshipped. They worshipped Jesus. They took the time. And, and now remember, Jesus could have been anywhere up to a couple of years, probably about a year uh, of age. And um, they worshipped him. And I can just imagine Mary and Joseph um, sitting there thinking, what, what is all this? What's going on here? I mean, they had enough already to digest from previous times. And now these magi from the, from the east come and they do this. Well, we need to do that as well. And then we need to keep uh, listening to God. This story would not have been a very good story had the, uh, had the Magi left Bethlehem and then gone back to Jerusalem like they were asked to do by the king. Uh, we read that in, uh, in verse uh, 12 of, of uh, what, what happens. And, and this is, uh, to me, one of the lessons and I, I think of, when I think of this, I think of the story of Abraham who listened to the voice of God when he offered his son Isaac. And he, he listens to the voice of God. It's incredibly tough. I, I, can you just imagine um, if his son would have died, um, the wrath he would have faced when he got home <laughs> from his wife. <laughs> um, how do you explain this one away? A promise of a son, and the son comes and then you sacrifice him? And uh, anyways, he was obedient, obedient. And he takes his son up and uh, as, as the knife was in his hand about to come down, he didn't stop listening to God. He kept listening to God. He, Psalm 121, he kept his eyes. He kept his eyes up. The wise men kept looking. Are we keeping on looking to God at all times? And so they brought their gifts, they did their duty, and they could have said, we've done our part. Pack their suitcases, repack their camels, and, and uh, headed back. But they didn't. They weren't guided by Herod. Nor were they guided by stars. I believe they were guided by the Spirit of God. How do I, why do I believe that? Because look at verse 12, what it says. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. You remember, these are the Magi. These are astrologers, magicians. And they're very much used to the spirit world. And when they get a dream, they listen to the dream. They pay attention. We all have dreams. We all have dreams. All of us. And... You also know the difference between a dream that's just a dream that's because maybe we had too much pizza at night or something <laughs> versus, versus a dream in which we, when we wake up, we remember exactly the details and there's something in your spirit and you can't, your, your cognitive mind cannot uh, process it, but your spirits do. And we know in our spirits, this is of God. And we act on those dreams and at least I hope we act on those things or at least we pay attention to it and so it is with the, these men and they kept listening to God and they, they, they listened to the dream and they did the right thing and they avoided uh, this um, at least their disaster and pushed off uh, the, the pending disaster that was here by, by King Herod and so as we uh, finish up for tonight and we look at this uh, I, I, I want us to learn the lessons of the wise men you know there's some stories about even the star uh, you, you read some people who are saying this is a, 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 a stellar uh, lineup with uh, Jupiter and a few other stars that came into place and made it a big. Well, it's a nice, it's a nice theory. The only problem with that theory is that number one, they saw the star from the east. Okay, so it's a long ways away, uh, and then apparently it. Why didn't everybody else see it? So there's something mystical about this, right? And even though uh, history, they, they tell us, astrologers tell us that back in about 7 um, AD that there was a, a stellar lineup with some of the planets and some of the stars and, and there was a, a, a tremendous light. Well, okay, e even so, but the verse here tells us later it specifically went over the place where he was staying. 
So there's something beyond here, just a few stars in the sky lighting up. And God is, uh, he's speaking. He speaks to each one of us. And uh, what he may speak to you, and you may hear it clearly, somebody else can't hear. And so let's be open and sensitive to the voice of God when he speaks to us. When he speaks to us, let's pay attention to him. Let's be like the wise men and come before him with humble hearts, accepting hearts, because we never know what God has in store for us. And uh, these men, the three of them, there's no names to them, but for 2,000 years we celebrate them, uh, who they are. Why? Because they listened to the voice of God. Father, thank you for this tonight. We commit ourselves to you this evening. I pray, O oh Lord God, keep us sensitive. Make us more sensitive to the leading, to the guiding of your spirit. Let us learn the lessons of these wise men. And help us, O oh Lord, to follow in after your footsteps, after your will. Help us to see your leading. Help us to see your guiding daily, daytime and at night. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.